I'm someone who loves RPGs, but gameplay-wise, unless a traditional RPG battle system has something totally off the wall like Chrono Cross's element grid system, or something spicy like Paper Mario-style action commands, I find myself just wanting to play a tactical RPG instead because there's usually just so much more interesting strategic decision making. So when I heard Ekenfell being described as a blend of grid-based tactical gameplay and Paper Mario-style action commands, I was super hyped. The only other tactics game I've played that has any kind of timing based action commands before this was Hoshigami ruining Blue Earth for PS1. But that system had no variety to its timing challenges. Ekenfell, on the other hand, has an incredible plethora of fun little timing mini games that all fit around a specific character's theming. It doesn't quite hit the same heights as Paper Mario with these, because all the action commands in Ekenfell are done through variations of just pressing A, so there's a bit less variety. However, it makes up for that with the complexity of its grid based tactical combat. Now, I must say that for a tactics game, the grid is pretty small and so is your party, plus, there's no terrain or elevation effects, but that doesn't mean this system isn't complex, it just has a different kind of focus to its gameplay. Ekenfell has somehow managed to streamline and condense two of my favorite kinds of battle systems into one unique new take on turn-based RPG combat, and for this uniqueness alone, I think any RPG fan should give it a shot. But hey, that's not all that makes a game good, so let's take a look at all the other aspects of Ekenfell that make it so fun to play before we dive deeper into the battle system later on. A good place to start is the story. Our main character, Mariette, ventures out to the magic school of Ekenfell to try and check up on her older sister, who's a student there. Mariette has never been able to use magic, but due to some mysterious circumstances, her fire magic powers are awakened when she gets into a fight with the guardians surrounding the school. After this fight, you enter the school and nearly no one is there, and it seems really weird. Things get even more mysterious as you start to find these crystals around the school that show you visions of the past and start to unravel what really happened to the school and to your sister. How these are relevant to the present situation Mariette is dealing with is a mystery you'll uncover over time as you meet more people and learn more about this cool world. The best part about this story is definitely how it builds mystery and intrigue right from the start. There are so many things that start to slowly build in chapter 1 alone. Other than the stone that shows you flashbacks and the mystery of why Ekenfell was even closed, you also get to meet two characters who seem really interesting but disappear shortly after meeting them, making you want to play further to see more from them. Then one of the first boss battles introduces the concept of a spirit character, who gets you excited to fight more of them further in the game. Then the last mystery in chapter 1 is this dark secret passageway you use to get into Ekenfell that you open with forbidden blood magic. The tone in this weird forbidden dimension is a 180 from the bright cheerful forest opening. When you're trying to make your way out of this strange place, you then realize some unknown creepy thing is following you. And just as it's about to catch up to you, you barely get away in time and enter Ekenfell to start off chapter 2. This opening chapter is really good at making you want to continue playing the game to see how all these intriguing setups eventually pay off. I won't spoil too much more because this is a story in which the appeal lies in uncovering the mysteries, but trust me that there are some really cool twists and turns. The adventure through Ekenfell does an amazing job of balancing being lighthearted fun while taking the time to explore the mysteries of this world and the deeper sides of its characters' personalities. I'd say it's similar in overall tone to like Steven Universe or something like that. And speaking of those characters, along your playthrough you'll meet 6 playable characters total who all feel super unique in their relevance to the story, their moveset, and their design. While only 3 of these 6 can be in your party at one time, the game thankfully continues to level up characters who aren't in your party at a slightly reduced rate so that all your characters will stay viable throughout the whole game without needing to grind. This makes it so that all the characters get their time to shine in battle depending on what kind of enemies you're fighting. Each character also gets their time to shine during the story too. The diverse cast all have really unique personalities and relationships relationships with each other. I don't think there's a single character I didn't enjoy, and the well-written character dialogue kept me wanting to see more even when the plot was dragging its feet at some points. Uh, to be honest, that's actually my only real complaint with this story. It sometimes gives you contrived reasons to go from point A to point B without having those reasons feel very strongly connected to the main plot threads of the game. Now if there was a little bit more wacky weirdness, like something like Earthbound, I could put up with this because sometimes RPGs don't have the plot as the main focus, but that being said, even the more filler sections of this game always do have at least a few good character moments that take you through a huge variety of beautiful visual aesthetics. And speaking of those visuals, honestly this game is just beautiful right from the title screen to the very end. The pixel art might seem a little too low bit for some people's tastes at first, but when you play the game, you'll see how they went with this style because it allows the characters to be much more expressive and well animated. 
The environments all have a ton of detail and aesthetic variety too, so there's no real need to worry about the low pixel count art taking away from that either. I think the creators just wanted to make a really polished and expansive world with tons of unique animations and designs, so they went with a style where they could achieve that on their indie budget. All that being said, when you do transition to battles, the pixel count for characters goes way up and there's really some stunning art and animation on display here. The amount of different moves you and your enemies all have, most of which have really flashy and unique animations, keep the battles looking great throughout the whole game. What helps sell these great visuals is that the music for this game is straight up amazing. The soundtrack blends chiptune and acoustic instruments perfectly, which is another element that reminded me of Steven Universe. Then when my friend told me that the composers from Steven Universe made a lot of the music for Ekenfell, it started to make sense. This is one of the most consistently beautiful soundtracks I've ever heard. There's a ton of variety and each song fits the area it's made for super well. Before I move on from the music, I do have to mention that there's this one song after you beat the star boss that I'm pretty sure is a reference to the song in the star area in Paper Mario 64. It's these little touches like that that just add that endless amount of charm in Ekenfell. Here's another example. All the save points in the game are cats. It reminded me of how all the save points are frogs in Mother 3, and I just love touches like this. Having a unique and weird save point is always just more fun than having some abstract glowing crystal like most RPGs. There's actually a lot of things here that go against the grain of RPG conventions. For instance, there's no standard mindless attack button. Instead, all your methods of attacking are done through unique spells. In another unique turn, there's no mana in the game though. I like this touch because it makes it so the different spells are more focused on being used in diverse ways in terms of positioning and how many enemies it can hit. So each new attack you get adds a real level of depth to your strategies instead of just being more powerful because it costs more mana like in most RPGs. And the spells that you have from the very beginning are so different from these new spells that they still retain their value deep into the game. Now, to balance the game when you get much more powerful spells later, these spells will have a cooldown period after use. A lot of these which require a cooldown are buff or debuff spells that affect you for a few turns, so it only makes sense for them to have a cooldown. I'm really glad that they made buffing and debuffing actually a really powerful option in Ekenfell if used right, and it makes them worth taking a whole turn to cast them. So many RPGs get this wrong and make it ambiguous if the buffs are even worth not attacking for. But since Ekenfell is a tactical RPG, there's even more depth with being able to do things like retreating and then buffing so you can buff without even being attacked that turn. To add even more complexity to this system though is that you have access to a plethora of items that buff and debuff and they bypass the cooldown and the requirement to hit an action command. So items end up becoming really powerful and I often found them necessary to win some fights. So many RPGs have a ton of interesting items but your abilities are so powerful you end up not ever using them in interesting ways. That's not the case at all here, I found myself using items all the time and it made the money in the game all the more valuable too. The game gives you just the right amount of money to scrape by at a really satisfying level of challenge if you aren't grinding for cash. One other thing I do have to mention about the money is that it's really fun that the coins you get from the battle scatter out of the enemy just like they do in Paper Mario and you have to be quick to pick them up. This is really rare to see in an RPG and I'm so glad they included it. It makes something like getting money after a battle, which is usually a foregone conclusion, into a fun little mini game on the overworld. Speaking of the overworld, Ekenfell's overworld movement controls super well and there's really fun gimmicks and puzzles in the overworld to keep this part of the game fresh. There's also hidden collectibles like the rare gems which are a fun reward for trying to find the secrets of the overworld, many of which are really cleverly hidden, but still telegraphed to the player enough that if you're paying attention you'll find them without ever getting really frustrated. This is really good because most RPGs neglect the fact that the player will be spending hours walking around the world, so you should definitely take care to make that part more fun. This is something that the Mario RPGs do better than nearly any other RPG, and Ekenfell definitely took some influence from them to make this aspect of their RPG much more engaging. It's also important that the overworld movement controls feel so good because you'll be using those controls to avoid enemy encounters. 
There are no random encounters in the game. If you're quick enough, you can avoid all the optional battles, which instantly makes any RPG better in my opinion. It makes it so any backtracking you want to do now is less tedious and the player also gets some agency over the pacing of the game. If you're someone who likes to grind random battles, you can, and if you're someone who tries to blaze through games at a low level, you can do that too. However, the game does eventually do the secret of mana type thing, it disguises some enemies to blend in with the environment to make them harder to avoid. I think this is cool because it keeps you on your toes even when you're just walking around. Now if you do happen to be caught off guard by a battle and die though, it's actually not that bad because save points are quite frequent. And as a bonus, your health also always restores fully at any save point, which makes for a much less frustrating experience. The frequency of save points is also great because if you only have the time to play the game for 15 minutes, you can still usually get to a save point even within that short amount of time. Further elements in the battle system also ease frustration. For example, the clutch factor is a fun mechanic where if you hit A at the right timing just before your character dies, they have a chance of getting back up with one health left. This is super hype when you hit it in a clutch moment and it's a really useful mechanic. Unfortunately, the game doesn't teach you about this until like 4 or 5 hours into the game, and I think it's fun to have some mechanics hidden with the chance that the player finds them on their own, but this one is just so useful, especially in the early game when you're dying a lot while learning the game that it seems weird to hide this mechanic. One nice thing is that if you do miss your clutch factor and end up wiping your whole party, you don't get sent back to your last save. You get the option to redo the battle from the same status as when you started it, or you can always go back to your last save and change your party and equipment if you want. This makes it so much less frustrating to lose a battle because it makes you want to try again because you know that you can beat it if you just hit a few more action commands the next time. Honestly, I could go on for so much longer about all the nice quality of life touches this game has that should really be essential to a modern RPG, but so many neglect them and have slightly frustrating aspects all over the game. Here's just some of the examples of that that I don't really have the time to go into detail about for this video. And there's much more I could add to that list. I really appreciated all they did to make their game such a more smooth experience. Surprisingly, all this effort to ease frustration doesn't make the game too easy though. In fact, these aspects kind of allow the game to be really difficult while still not feeling unfair. Ekenfell's challenge level really makes you have to use items and hit all your action commands and position carefully even in optional battles. I think too many RPGs are so easy that you're never forced to explore all the interesting elements of the combat system. That's not the case with Ekenfell though, they knew how well designed their battle system was and they wanted to teach you how to fully use every element to get the best experience out of it. The game's systems are really deep, but you'll never feel like you're being blasted with tutorials and the game leaves room for you to discover certain complexities on your own. All that being said, if you find the game too hard to be fun, there is a lot of really nice settings for gameplay. The most crucial one being that you can make it so the action commands always give you a nice, so that you can try for a great without as much stress, or you can just set it so that you always get a great. This is perfect for players who struggle with these things or just prefer to play without them. These kinds of inclusions help the game be accessible to many more players and it shows that the devs really care about their audience. Furthermore, you can tell they really care about their players because in the settings not related to gameplay you can find that they went the extra mile and included optional content warnings when sensitive subjects are about to be covered in the story, and a photosensitive mode for those who don't react well to too much flashing lights or images. It should also be mentioned that there's really good representation of marginalized groups in Ekenfell. It's very LGBTQ friendly and handles a lot of subjects many games don't even try to touch with the maturity and respect they deserve. I really think all these things that make the audience feel more comfortable and cared about are touches that all modern games should be taking notes from. I had such a great experience with Ekenfell, and a lot of what left such an impression with me is how many little details they took the care to add. I'm someone who plays a lot of retro RPGs, so playing this modern one and seeing so many aspects of those classics be improved upon really gives me hope for the future of turn-based RPGs. I hope developers only continue to innovate and iterate like this and we see even more unique games like Ekenfell in the future. If you want to see more games like this, go support Happy Ray Games and pick up a copy of Ekenfell. It's on pretty much every modern gaming platform, which is really convenient. Anyways, I could gush about this game forever, but I think I'll end it here. Let me know any games you want to see covered in the comments and subscribe if you want to see more RPG reviews because I'll definitely be doing more in the near future. So thanks so much for watching and I hope you all have a great day.